Welcome to tonight's Cafe Scientific at Stanford Blood Center. My name is Kevin O'Neill in the Marketing and Communications Department. Stanford Blood Center was a part of the pathology department within the Stanford School of Medicine until the end of this September. We are now a part of Stanford Healthcare. Stanford Blood Center is the primary supplier of blood products to Stanford Healthcare, which is the second largest user of blood products in the nation, as well as to two other hospitals in our community. Of the approximately 70 blood centers in the United States, only two are considered to be academic community blood centers, Stanford Blood Center being one of the two. The academic facet of our mission has been a springboard for many milestones and in industry-leading discoveries made here. Our success would not have been possible without our faithful blood donors, many of whom are here this evening. Thank you all. We have the blood center brochures on our entry table, as well as a sign-in sheet if you'd like to be added to our email list. There is also a copy of an article in the Stanford Medicine Magazine on that same table by an award-winning author, Ruth Ann Richter, about Dr. Engelman's discovery of the first test for HIV. This achievement resulted in shielding hundreds of patients in local hospitals from this deadly disease. This article details the hard to believe response to this discovery on the part of the American blood banking industry. I see it as Stanford Blood Center's very own profile and courage. Now I would like to introduce our CEO, Harpreet Sandhu, who will introduce Dr. Engelman. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, it will be an extremely exciting presentation. Uh, and with that, I'd actually like to introduce Dr. Engelman. Dr. Engelman is a professor of pathology and medicine at Stanford University School of Medicine. He joined the faculty in 1978 after completing training in internal medicine at UCSF, biochemistry at the NIH, and immune, uh, immunology, rheumatology, and transfusion medicine here at Stanford. In 1979, Dr. Engelman established the Stanford Blood Center. Uh, for which he has provided medical and strategic direction since its inception almost 40 years ago. Dr. Engelman is also the co-director of the Immunology and Immunotherapy Program at Stanford Cancer Institute. He has supervised more than 150 research trainees, authored 300 scientific articles, and has been an editor of multiple scientific journals. For the past 25 years, Dr. Engelman's group has been studying rare but powerful white blood cells called dendritic cells. After developing methods for isolating and arming human dendritic cells, he conceived the idea of using them to vaccinate patients against their own tumors. 20 years ago, he and his collaborators at Stanford Blood Center and Stanford Hospital began testing this idea in patients with cancer. His technology provided the basis for the Prevenge Prostate uh, Cancer Vaccine, the first active immunotherapy for cancer to be approved in, uh, by the FDA in, 20, in 2010. This vaccine opened the way to a new era in which immunotherapies are increasingly becoming a standard component of, uh, of cancer treatment. In fact, Dr. Engelman's laboratory recently discovered an extremely potent approach to arming and activating dendritic cells in tumor-bearing hosts that doesn't require removal or manipulation of these cells. This new approach has been shown to eradicate a variety of cancers in experimental animals and is expected to an enter clinical trials very soon. And without much further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Engelman. Well, welcome to the, to the Blood Center, uh, all of you, and um, thanks for being here. I know some of you are my friends or my family, <laughs> forced to come. <laughs> Others I know were in attendance a few days ago at, uh, when we had a special breakfast for our blood donors who have donated at least 100 gallons is that right? Oh, 100 times. OK. 100 times. <laughs> uh, and I know we have at least one here who has donated 600 times. 700. Is it 700? Yeah. It was Eric. OK. OK. Well, anyway, it's some ridiculous number. <laughs> and, uh, 
an indication of great health and great generosity. And the blood center, uh, as, as Harpreet said, is dependent on our, our blood donors. And, um, and I've been dependent on our blood donors ever since we started this. Uh, we haven't always been located here. Some of you who know us well know that we, well, you probably don't know this, but the original site of our blood bank was actually on this, on this street back in the 1970s. And then we moved over to Welch Road, where we were for about 25 years. And then over the past 10 years, we've been here. We moved here because of, um, we just couldn't accommodate the size of our program in the building on Welch Road. And of course, we got out of town just before they started tearing up the entire neighborhood there. So we're happy to be in this location. Um, when, you, when some of you are blood donors, and as, as you know, when you donate the blood, most of it goes to patients and saves their, saves their lives. But there is a component of the blood that we remove. And we remove it because it, it, it's uh, better for the patients who receive the blood. That component uh, is the white blood cells. So your blood consists of red, red blood cells, which, of course, are responsible for making the blood red. <clears throat> and those cells carry the oxygen to the tissues. There are platelets, which are small uh, fragments of cells that are necessary for preventing bleeding and stopping bleeding. There's a variety of proteins in the clear fluid, the yellow fluid, or plasma, as we call it, that is also uh, very important. But the, but the white blood cells are, are, uh, are very powerful and very important for your health, but they're designed essentially to attack. And so if we include the white blood cells with the blood transfusion that goes into our patients at Stanford and elsewhere, there is the risk that those cells could attack and harm the recipient of the transfusion. So since we, from the time we first started the blood center, which is almost 40 years ago, we have routinely removed the white blood cells uh, for, that per for that reason. Now, we didn't throw them out. And that, that's the good news. And the good news for me and, and some of my colleagues in my research lab that are here tonight is that we make them available for research. Uh, research from our lab, research from other labs, uh, mainly at Stanford, but all over the country, actually. And, and so I started studying white blood cells uh, about 40 years ago uh, from this source. And when I started, uh, at that time, our understanding of the immune system and of the human immune system in particular was, was incredibly uh, primitive. We knew that there were white blood cells. We knew that there were cells that we could call lymphocytes and perhaps uh, granulocytes. But we had no idea how complicated our immune cells actually are. And it turns out that there are many types of white blood cells, not just one or two or three, but many each of which has a highly specialized function, each of which is capable of producing many distinct molecules. Uh, and, and then they interact with one another. Uh, so when, when we're infected with a virus or a bacterium, um, they attack and they do it in a coordinated way. In, in addition, they have what we call immunologic memory, at least some of the cells. So once you've been exposed or infected with a particular virus, there is immunologic memory. So the next time you're exposed to that virus, uh, the response is much faster and much more potent. So now we know over the years a great deal about uh, the existence of these cells uh, using a variety of tools. Our group and others have been able to come up with ways of identifying each cell, analyzing what they make, what they do. And one of the great frustrations over at least the first 30 years or 20 years of my research career has been why, why don't these cells attack cancer? Why is it that patients who develop cancer, um, why is it that their immune systems don't respond and eradicate the tumor? Because by definition, tumors that develop have managed to escape or avoid or overcome any kind of immune attack. And what we've, what we've witnessed now over the past <clears throat> 20 years, and particularly in the last five, is that this main question has now begun to be solved. And we can now uh, begin to take advantage of the incredible array of weapons that our immune system 
presents. And, uh, and, and my lab uh, has been working on this pretty much 24-7 for the last uh, many years. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to uh, tell you how much progress has actually been made. And we're certainly not the only ones working in this area, although since I'm the speaker, I can talk about what we've done. But I'll try to, I'll try to identify what we've done and what others have done. And as, as mentioned by um, Harpreet, uh, that we, we have uh, been particularly interested <clears throat> in one type of white blood cell, which is called the dendritic cell. I'll show you why it's called the dendritic cell in a moment. So I will tell you. <clears throat> so as we think about cancer and immunotherapy, um, there are lots of reasons why it hasn't worked so far. In the first place, the tumor itself is very clever. Uh, they, these tumor cells produce molecules that are designed to, um, uh, to, uh, to defeat our immune system, and they're pretty darn good at it. Uh, the other problem is that tumors consist mainly of normal tissue components. They're not foreign. The best parts of our immune cells are designed to recognize substances that our body has not seen before. We call those foreign substances. But since tumors consist mainly of self-substances and self-antigens, it's really hard to distinguish them from normal tissues. And in fact, we have a whole system in place to eliminate or neutralize our cells that are capable of recognizing and reacting against self-tissues. If we if we didn't have those checks and breaks in, in place, we would all be suffering from autoimmune disease. And um, so we have those systems in place, and the question is, how can we kind of get around them and, and fight cancer? So the goal of immunotherapy <clears throat> for cancer is to either bypass or overcome these barriers and attack the tumor, preferably without harming the patient. <clears throat> now, as the years have uh, has gone on and we've developed increasing number of, of ways to do this, I like to divide the approaches into passive immunotherapy and active immunotherapy. Um, passive immunotherapy basically refers to um, either cells or molecules or drugs that do the work, that, that don't require the patient's immune system to do much of anything. Um, so examples of passive immunotherapy would be monoclonal antibodies that target uh, the tumor. Uh, now, monoclonal antibodies, as I, as I realize I'm repeating this technical term, and not all of you will know what I mean, but an antibody is a protein produced by certain types of immune cells, and these proteins attack and, and bind and attack very specific targets. We have millions of these particular proteins or antibodies in our systems. Each one is specific for um, a particular target molecule. And, it, uh, and many years ago, a technology was developed to enable us to produce a single antibody at a time and produce it over and over again so you could have a pure but a large number of the same exact antibodies. So you can make an antibody that binds specifically to a particular tumor cell. Now, unfortunately, when antibodies bind to tumor cells, they don't do much. They bind and they may have a modest effect, but they don't cure cancer. Nonetheless, a number of monoclonal antibodies are now available, have been FDA approved, and are widely used for tumors such as certain types of breast cancer, certain types of lymphoma, certain types of lung cancer. The other type of passive immunotherapy has to do with the white blood cells themselves. We can now train certain types of white blood cells called T lymphocytes to attack tumors. Um, and this has turned out to be very difficult to do. Uh, in the last a few years, some of you may have heard of a term called CAR T cells. These are chimeric antigen receptor T cells where the actual T cells of the patient have been genetically engineered in the test tube to be able to attack their own tumor. This is a really incredible process, incredible advance. The main challenge to CAR T cells is their cost, which is enormous. Imagine trying to genetically engineer the T cells of 
an individual patient and returning them later, uh, and whether or not they're going to work for a large number of tumors. But we'll get into that a little later. Then on the right here, I, I call these therapies active immunotherapies because unlike passive immunotherapies where they do all the work, the active immunotherapy um, is a team effort. You provide something to the patient that is going to activate the patient's own immune system to attack the tumor. And we've, our, our, our research group has been focusing on this now for a very long time. Um, and as you heard a moment ago, we, we focused on the use of dendritic cells as tumor vaccines. And I'll tell you a little bit about that work in, in a moment and how that evolved over time and eventually resulted in an FDA-approved uh, therapy. But there are other newer Immuno, active immunotherapies, uh, and perhaps the one that is known the best today uh, is the checkpoint antibodies. How many of you have heard of checkpoint antibodies? Uh, because, well, Mary, of course, who's, who understands this field, has heard of checkpoint antibodies. But I started hearing about the, the most amazing thing is that within the last year or two, I, when, as I'm listening to the radio and I periodically hear advertisements from Stanford Medicine, they say, we now have the means to treat your cancer with checkpoint antibodies. Um, this is a, a remarkable advance, a remarkable breakthrough. That, um, and these antibodies are not targeting the tumor cells per se. They're actually targeting the immune system. And what they are doing is targeting the, the molecules in the immune system that apply the breaks. So by neutralizing the breaks of the immune system, you are now releasing the, the immune system to attack the tumor. And this is a remarkable advance. We now have uh, two of these antibodies that have been uh, approved by the FDA, and they're being used to treat uh, a relatively wide range of cancers. Um, they're still not curing cancer, but they're, they've had some pretty powerful effects, quite exciting. OK. Well, let's go back then and, and uh, review the basic concept and how did we end up discovering and developing uh, the first cancer treatment vaccine. Well, when we started, we were faced with the, what I call the old view. The old view was that the inability of the immune system to attack cancer was inherent and irreversible. Um, and it was due mainly to the idea that the immune cells that could recognize self were eliminated during development. And, and that idea was not only widely accepted, we taught it in our courses for, the, for 50 years. The new view is that the old view is wrong, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> um, and that, um, that, in fact, the idea that, uh, that uh, immune cells capable of recognizing self are completely eliminated is simply an exaggeration. It's just not true. The new view is that you can, in fact, develop or induce effective anti-tumor immunity um, in a tumor-bearing host, i.e., a cancer patient, provided that the right substances or antigens are presented by the right cells to the patient's immune system and that the immunosuppressive environment of the tumor is overcome. In other words, I remember I told you in the beginning that tumors make a, a variety of substances that can block or inhibit the immune system. So we have to overcome that, and we have to do these other things. And if we do that, we win. That much we've learned over the last many years. So why dendritic cells? Well, dendritic cells, or DC as we call them, are these incredibly powerful antigen processing and presenting cells. They're all over your body, although they're not terribly frequent, but if your skin is actually uh, embedded with them. Um, and these cells get their name because of their long dendrites. Uh, you can see them here. But this is a cell. This is an individual cell. And inside this cell, there's a nucleus, just like every other cell. But they have these long dendrites. And they're sitting in your tissues, not just in your skin, but throughout your body, looking for things that shouldn't be there. They're really your, sent your sentinels. They're born in the bone marrow, where most of our blood cells are born. They then leave the marrow, and they migrate via the bloodstream to various tissues throughout the body. They then take up their posts. In the skin, we call some of them Langerhans cells. In the deeper skin, we call them dermal dendritic cells. And they stay in their tissues for, for our entire life until or unless something comes along that is a threat or perceived to be a threat. So these cells have 
uh, exquisite ability to recognize and sense when something in the environment shouldn't be there and should be attacked. And when that happens, they get all excited. Uh, their little processes or dendrites start wiggling around and capturing what's there and bring them inside the cell. And then they leave their posts. And they leave them via the lymphatic vessels when, and they travel into the draining lymph nodes. In case you didn't know what your lymph nodes are good for, they're really important immune organs. And inside the lymph nodes, the dendritic cells have, get intimately uh, together with your T cells. Sometimes they're called CD4 and CD8 T cells, your natural killer cells and your B cells. Each of these is a different type of white blood cell. And they're all housed in our lymph nodes or our lymphoid organs, waiting to be told what to do by, you guessed it, the dendritic cell. And, um, and that's how an immune response is initiated. And because of this phenomenon, um, those of us that study dendritic cells uh, and spend a lot of our time studying them think of them as the center of our immunological universe or the immuniverse. So what about dendritic cell-based therapeutic vaccines? Now, um, I, I started working on this back in the late 80s, uh, the concept that we might be able to isolate these cells from cancer patients and arm them with substances from the tumor and use those cells to induce an immune response was a very simple, crude idea. I, I mentioned to you many of the reasons why most people would have thought it wouldn't work, but that's what we, we did. And I could not have done this without, obviously, the very bright people who work in my lab, but also without the blood center's support because we had access to the white blood cells that the blood donors donate, and we were able to figure out how do we isolate these cells. So we did, we practiced, we tested a, a bunch of ideas, and eventually we figured out a way to isolate these cells from the blood. And because um, they were very rare, they constitute less than 1% of the white cells in blood. <clears throat> so anyway, the idea was to obtain these cells from their precursors in the blood, load them, with antigen, I abbreviate that AG, from a tumor, um, and then allow those cells to take up the antigen and mature. And after a couple of days, the idea was to purify them and return them via a transfusion, if you will, to the patients. That's how simple and crude this idea was. So uh, to put a, a pictorial spin on this, um, just like a blood donor who is donating uh, for uh, phoresis, the patient would come to our blood bank. They would undergo a leukophoresis, which is very similar to a platelet phoresis. They would, um, from that leukophoresis, we would get quite a few white blood cells. The red cells and the platelets, all of that would get returned back to the patient. And this procedure took about an hour and a half, and generally painless, because we have such skilled nurses. Um, in any event, then in the, in the test tube, we would work on getting our dendritic cells. We would uh, co-culture them or add our tumor-derived substances uh, to those cells. And after we cooked them or cultured them for about two or three days, we would then purify them and inject them back into the patient. Now, as an aside, um, it's very interesting that if I were to do this today, it would cost me about 100 times what it cost me 25 years ago to do. Now, why is that? It's not inflation. It's because when we first started doing this, the FDA was not regulating cell therapy. Now, I don't want to attack the government, far be it from me. Um, but after we started doing these kinds of studies, uh, the FDA said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, this is something we should regulate, right? And so, um, and so we, we, they came to me. Uh, after we started, we were doing uh, a number of clinical trials and clinical experiments here at Stanford and uh, over a period of several years. And then they came to me, not in an angry way, just uh, asking for my advice and help as to how we could regulate this new idea of cell-based therapy. Because prior to this time, there really was no such thing as cellular therapy. Uh, all, of, all of the drugs are you know, liquids or pills and things. And, one size fits all. This was the, the idea here was a little bit more like a specialized blood transfusion where we're purifying a particular type of cell, we're manipulating it, 
and we're giving it back to the same patient who donated or provided the blood in the first place. Well, anyway, um, the FDA decided it wanted to regulate this. And as a result of their regulations, which took them 10 or 15 years to develop, it's now much more expensive, unfortunately, uh, to do this experiment. So in those days, back in the 1990s, when we did these experiments for the first time, I estimate that it cost us about $500, maybe $1,000 tops per patient to do this. Today, it would cost me thirty dollars to $50,000 per patient, easily. We have to have special equipment. We have to have special testing done because the agency feels it's responsible for assuring that anything we put into a human being is safe and, well, let's say, say safe. <laughs> so, so that's the way it goes. Is, uh, but at the time, we were able to do these experiments. Obviously, we were concerned. And if you're taking something out of a patient and you're putting something back in, you want to make sure it's sterile and not going to cause an infection. So we made sure of that. We cultured the, the cells and, and did those kinds of tests. But it still wasn't very expensive. And we were able to carry out small clinical experiments or trials here at Stanford in, in, in various diseases, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, multiple myeloma, prostate cancer, HIV infection, and finally colorectal cancer. And in every case, in every one of these studies was done in patients who had advanced disease, metastatic disease, whose options uh, were limited, basically zero. So when we started this, the first uh, patient we injected was in about 1993, as I recall, and that was in patients with uh, lymphoma. This is not a patient with lymphoma. After we completed the lymphoma study, which was very encouraging, we did a study in colorectal cancer um, with metastases. And this is a patient who had colorectal cancer uh, with metastases into the liver and into the lungs. And you can see the metastases. Oops, sorry about that. Uh-oh, there we go. Um, this is a, actually a pleural effusion, but uh, the metastases are here. And then after treatment, with uh, three injections of this vaccine, the tumor disappeared. The patient was not cured. The tumor came back about a year later. But the important thing is that we were able to induce a powerful immune response against the patient's own tumor, very well tolerated, no, no serious side effects. And so after we did some of these experiments, um, I did what every, every good uh, faculty member and student at Stanford is supposed to do. Um, I should tell you, Stanford owns my, our inventions. Uh, and, um, and the goal of the University Office of Technology Licensing is to disseminate these inventions and make them available to industry so that they can be developed uh, as real drugs. <clears throat> now, the idea of taking a cell therapy, the first cell therapy, and trying to develop it with the FDA's approval all the way through clinical trials um, is a very complicated and costly thing. And there was no way that we could ever do that here at Stanford. So I filed invention, an invention disclosure with the, with the Stanford Office of Technology Licensing. And then I looked initially to see if there would be a, an existing pharmaceutical company that would be interested in taking this on. And there were none because the conventional pharmaceuticals, as I mentioned a few moments ago, are one size fits all. You put a drug in a bottle, and you inject it, or you take it by a pill. The idea of trying to do cell-based therapy, very difficult, understandable. But I was fortunate enough to be able to convince local venture, uh, not local, venture capitalists um, to fund this effort. And the company was begun called Dendrion, very famous or infamous company, depending on your point of view. And the company licensed our technology from Stanford, and then, um, and then basically worked with members of my lab and some of the former members of my lab who decided to go work for the company to transfer the technology. And then they went about trying to decide what cancer should they initially develop a, a vaccine for. And they decided on uh, prostate cancer. And I'll tell you why in a moment. And then the company went ahead to develop a reliable, reproducible manufacturing process and design clinical trials, filed an official application to test the product with the FDA, and then proceeded to perform controlled clinical trials to assess the safety and efficacy of this approach. Um, I say that in about 47 seconds, and it, and it took 15 years and cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, hats off to the, to the company for, for doing that. Now, I was 
I was the scientific founder of the company, so I should tell you right now, I'm, I was completely conflicted in all of this, right? But I'm telling you historically what actually happened. And, um, and then an interesting question arises, well, so we showed that it could work at least to some extent in, in um, lymphoma and uh, perhaps in colorectal cancer. Why did the company decide to develop its, um, its product initially for prostate cancer? Anybody want to take a guess? Don't guess. <laughs> they were all male. Ah, they were male chauvinist pigs. <laughs> Incidents? Well, certainly a company would be interested in the size of the market. And so prostate cancer is one of the most common tumors, but it's not the most common tumor. There are about 10 really common tumors. No, the reason why prostate cancer was chosen was not because <clears throat> they were male chauvinist pigs as far as I can tell, <clears throat> but it had to do with fear. They were very nervous about the possibility that what we would do with our vaccine would be to induce some sort of life-threatening autoimmune disease. So if you want to make a vaccine against lung cancer and you're using materials from lung, are you going to induce some horrible lung disease, for example? Um, so the idea was to try to find a type of cancer that affected an organ that wasn't very important. <laughs> and that turns out to be the prostate. We have them, but we really don't need them. So, so the, the, the company scientists uh, working in collaboration with us uh, demonstrated that if you made a vaccine out of uh, prostate uh, substances and um, coupled that with dendritic cells and injected that into, into animals, <clears throat> experimental animals, it caused a rip-roaring prostatitis, <clears throat> an autoimmune disease, exactly, against the prostate. So that was good. That was good. That provided the rationale, the scientific rationale, to go from experimental animal studies straight into human clinical trials. However, that was a fateful decision because turns out that, in, for the most part, prostate cancer is pretty slow. Um, not always, but mostly. And it costs so much money and took so much time for the company to develop their vaccine for prostate cancer, they never were able to develop other vaccines for other tumors. Even though they had them all lined up and ready to go, they couldn't do it because it cost too much. So they did one. And, um, and this is an example of the data that were generated in the company's extensive clinical trials. And what you see here, this is, a, um, this is called a Kaplan-Meier curve. So what we have is the percentage of individuals who are alive along the y-axis here, and then the amount of time uh, they were studied for. So you can see right off the bat that these trials take a long time. First, you have to enroll the patients, then you have to treat them. And the company treated two groups. They had a group of people, of patients, who did not get the active vaccine, but they got a, a control, which is, I know, a tough concept, the idea that you enter a clinical trial and you don't even know whether you're going to get the active one or the inactive one. But unfortunately, we, the only way to know if something works is to compare it with something that looks almost the same but doesn't work. It doesn't hurt the patient, but probably doesn't help the patient either. And what you see here is that over time, uh, a higher percentage of the patients who received the active vaccine survived. Um, now, the difference, the difference is not dramatic. I mean, it depends on your point of view. At the time, it was believed to be dramatic because this was far and away the best efficacy that had been seen for advanced prostate cancer. All of these patients had metastatic disease. And, and what's shown here is you get about a four to six months extension of life on average, on average. Some patients lived a lot longer, some patients didn't benefit, but the average benefit was significant, but there were not people being cured. So by 2009, now the company transferred our technology in 1993, <laughs> just to give you some idea of how long this took. Um, but by 2009, more than 700 patients had been treated. It was clear that, there was, that the uh, uh, approach was quite safe and that there was a benefit. Uh, and on the basis of that, uh, the FDA approved this vaccine, which was originally called Cipulusal T, ultimately called Provenge. 
very clever name, Provenge. Um, and it was approved in, by the FDA in 2010. Okay, I was very proud of the fact that it was discovered here. Uh, it was exciting to see that the FDA finally pr approved a, a, a therapeutic cancer vaccine. Well, what were the problems? I already told you that, um, that it was really expensive. Uh, it shouldn't have been, but it, but it was. In fact, the company never made a profit in its entire existence, despite the fact that they generated, I think, close to $400 million in sales in one year. Uh, and they charged almost $100,000 for this product. So by definition, I would say if it cost them $100,000 and they charged $100,000, that's not a good business. It's also going to, if it ever actually took off, it would bankrupt uh, our system. But $100,000 is about the average of what a biological drug costs in the United States. At least that's what we pay for it. That's not what the company pays to manufacture it. But in this case, the cost was too high. The other problem was that the science was still primitive. We didn't really understand dendritic cells. Um, we thought all the dendritic cells were exactly alike. After all, they look the same. They must be the same. Now we know that dendritic cells consist of their own subpopulations. Some promote immunity, some block immunity. In fact, a, a member of my lab sitting right over there was one of the guys that first uh, demonstrated this, uh, Mike Alonso. And um, so, so we were preparing all the dendritic cells. We weren't, we weren't selecting only the ones that were the good guys. We were also selecting for some of the ones that would neutralize the effects. But then, and that probably explains, or it helps to explain the fact that nobody was being cured. They were being benefited, but, there were, but the efficacy was modest. Probably related to tumor-associated immunosuppression, uh, our limited understanding of dendritic cell biology, and what we call immunological escape. Now, I don't have time here tonight to go through all of this in detail. Um, I teach a course on tumor immunology, and we have 10 two-hour sessions, and we're almost finished for the quarter. Um, and uh, it would take that long to go through this in, in more detail. But at least you can understand that the efficacy uh, was problematic. And I, I have used this slide. The company hated it when I did this, by the way. <laughs> As you can imagine, how can our scientific founder go around and do this? Um, but uh, maybe it was a miracle, or maybe it wasn't. But it was certainly a miracle if you could afford it. And I actually, this is, this is one of my concerns with regard to many of the newer immunotherapies uh, today, particularly the ones that are individualized on a patient-specific basis. How can, we, how can we hope to do something that is going to be cost-effective if every time you want to treat somebody, you have to go through a three-day, a five-day, or a three-week process to manipulate their cells, genetically modify them, and then give them back? It's, it's a subject of another discussion, I think, but I would say it's a very difficult idea. So, so what have we been doing for the last 20 years? <laughs> um, well, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about this, and members of my lab have spent a lot of time thinking about this and trying to come up with ways that would allow us to use molecules that we could inject into a patient that would activate the dendritic cells, load the dendritic cells with tumor molecules, and induce an immune response without having to remove those precious cells, manipulate them for several days, and give them back. So, and this is not easy. Um, but again, I, I, am the, uh, I am the luckiest guy in the world because many Stanford students are brilliant. And my lab, and I'll show you a picture of a photograph of the lab at, at the end of the talk. Um, the students are brilliant, they're very energetic, they're very creative, and, they, and I've been lucky enough that many of them have come and worked here at the Stanford Blood Center in our lab, which is upstairs from, from this location. So anyway, the, the, the idea that, um, that led to this discovery, which is only published uh, in the last few months, is, um, is based on the fact that the naturally occurring tumors that arise spontaneously, which we call autologous tumors, which means tumors that arise in self, always escape the immune response. By definition, the tumor that's growing in a patient has escaped the immune system. In contrast, if 
we were to deliberately inject a tumor from person A into person B, that tumor would be destroyed. And in fact, it would be extraordinarily rare for the tumor to be able to grow in person B, unless person B is genetically identical to person A. Absent that, tumors are not infectious. They don't spread. It's amazing. And the idea then behind the experiments that were undertaken over the last four years was try to understand, well, why is that? Why hasn't anyone studied that in detail to understand how is it that we can reject those tumors, but we can't reject our own? Is it just because they're genetically different? OK, so they're genetically different. But what is the mechanism that allows the immune system to attack and be so thorough about it? Because unlike, well, they don't, they don't escape. So we decided, um, beginning about five years ago, led by a, a new um, student in the lab and several other students working with him, to study the immune response to these allogeneic tumors. And by doing so, we were able to identify the mechanistic basis for successful immune-mediated tumor rejection. I, I, I want to emphasize, this was not something that took a week. It wasn't based on this brilliant aha moment. It took four years of continuous study by at least five, six people in the lab. And I'm not going to go through the details because it's very heavy stuff. Um, but uh, the paper describing this was published in a journal called Nature about four or five months ago. And the summary of the findings are that in the allogeneic setting, in other words, where tumors are, now this, this was all done in experimental mice, um, so uh, not humans yet. Uh, but in the allogeneic setting, uh, when we transfer a tumor from mouse A to a different strain, mouse B, Tumors are rejected. And it turns out that the reason that they're rejected is that all mice and all of you actually have antibodies, those proteins we talked about a few moments ago, that recognize and bind to cells that are not your own. And this was a big surprise. We didn't think that we had such antibodies, um, but we do. Now, why Mother Nature decided to give us these antibodies, I don't know. But we have them. And those antibodies bind to the tumor. They don't kill the tumor, but they sound an alarm, if you will. They bind to the tumor, and they bridge the tumor, literally, physically bridge the tumor to nearby dendritic cells. And the dendritic cells can then uh, engulf the tumor, acquire the tumor antigens, and ultimately do what dendritic cells do, which is to activate an immune response. And it turned out that this relatively simple mechanism had not been discovered previously. And then the next question was, well, OK, fine. It's great to know why someone else's tumor is rejected by you. But who cares, since it never happens? Is it just tumor or any tissue? Any tissue. So if you want to transplant, actually, it's the same, same issue for transplantation of an organ like a kidney or a heart or a lung. In fact, we should have, should have figured that out a long time ago, because if you want to transplant a kidney from person A to person B, person B is going to reject that kidney unless you give them powerful immunosuppressive drugs, which are very toxic, by the way. So that's the opposite problem. So essentially, we were taking advantage of that mechanism, except it still wasn't known why, why those organs are rejected. Um, and in fact, I think this mechanism is probably responsible. But we were studying tumors not normal organs. <clears throat> so the next question was, OK, now you've figured out what's going on in that setting. Can you take advantage of it to treat tumors in their natural setting? Can you transfer the antibodies from person A into person B and cure their tumors? The answer is no. <laughs> if it was that simple, somebody would have discovered it. Um, but it does turn out that if you transfer those antibodies with something else, it works. And that something else turns out to be molecules that can wake up those sleepy dendritic cells in the tumor. I mentioned earlier that tumors make all kinds of substances that prevent the immune system from becoming activated. Among the substances they make are substances that put dendritic cells to sleep. 
specifically in the tumor. It's a remarkable thing. But the dendritic cells are still alive. So if you can overcome that sleepiness and you can deliver the tumor cells to the dendritic cells, you can, you can create a very powerful immunotherapy. And that's what we did. So when we did that, and um, I know this is a very, this is a scientific slide, and it's actually a figure from the paper, and I won't go through all the details except to tell you that the, the red line, the red line is the results of the mice with the tumor that get both components. So one component is the antibody that binds the tumor cells, and the other component are the molecules that activate the dendritic cells. And if we just give one component or the other, it doesn't work. You have to give both. So that was the discovery. And when you give both, you get a very powerful immune response. This is a melanoma, by the way, in a mouse. Um, and the melanoma is cured. It goes away, and it never comes back. Pretty good. We were pretty excited. Did the same thing for lung tumors. Again, the animals that got all the components were cured, and the animals that got some of the components were not. And perhaps even more importantly, and here's another example in, breast, in a breast cancer, if we treat a primary breast cancer in the breast of a mouse, we can cure that tumor. We're only injecting that tumor. Now here's a mouse that develops metastases, and the metastases are in the, oops, sorry, are in the lungs of the animal. So you can see them, all these horrible white-looking things are metastases. Uh, in, the, in the mouse lungs. So when we start this treatment of the primary tumor, the mouse already has metastases in the lungs. But we're only treating the primary, and yet the metastases go away. And that's shown here. Which means that by initiating an, an immune response, if it's sufficiently powerful, even if you initiate it inside the tumor, it spreads to the rest of the body. And that is one of the most exciting aspects of this new therapeutic approach. And I'll just tell you without going through these questions that there are a whole series of questions that remain to be answered. We have developed some new and very, um, very uh, sensitive tools to understand exactly what's going on in the bodies of these animals in which the, their tumors are being cured. Because we want to understand every uh, element. Uh, and so I, I'm not going to go through this either, but I have to tell you that we published a paper in another good journal called Science about two months after we published the paper in Nature. And the, uh, in the paper in Science describes the kinds of tools that we can now use to analyze the immune system uh, in the whole body. Well, OK, so how good is this new approach? I honestly don't know, because curing cancer in a mouse amounts to curing cancer in a mouse. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we don't know if it will translate uh, easily into uh, treatment, effective treatment for humans. But it's helpful to compare uh, this approach with the other, with, with the current most popular new approach, the immunotherapy for cancer, which are the checkpoint antibodies. I mentioned to you that these antibodies are designed to, um, to uh, neutralize the breaks on the immune response. So it's, it's a negative on a negative. And so by taking away the breaking system, it's releasing the immune system to try to attack. Now, there's a problem with that because you can potentially release the immune system to create autoimmune disease or attack normal tissues. But, but it appears that still the benefit, greatly outweigh, the benefit of, of these checkpoint antibodies greatly outweighs their current toxicity. So if we compare checkpoint antibodies, which are currently FDA approved and available for certain tumors, with this approach, which I call alloIgG plus DC stim. I know we have to come up with a better name than that. <clears throat> um, both approaches are, in theory, applicable to a wide range of tumors. In both cases, you have one size fits all, uh, applicable to a wide range of tumors. The mechanisms, however, are somewhat different. Uh, the way our approach works is by stimulating dendritic cells and letting those dendritic cells stimulate uh, a tumor response, whereas the checkpoints remove the molecular breaks on the immune response. <clears throat> in, the, 
In mouse models of melanoma, breast, colon, pancreas, and lung cancer, the potency <clears throat> of our approach exceeds that seen with checkpoint antibodies, substantially exceeds it. <clears throat> checkpoint antibodies really have little or no effect on most patients with breast cancer, or colon cancer, or pancreas cancer. Um, so that sounds pretty promising. However, and I emphasize this, checkpoint antibodies have been proven to be effective and generally safe in patients with selected cancers, while our approach have not even yet entered clinical trials. So despite the excitement that we've enjoyed um, with, uh, with the, and the promise that we have from this approach, we do not know yet if it's going to work in human beings, and if it does, whether it's going to be safe and well-tolerated or dangerous. So with that in mind, I just want to make sure you're aware of those limitations. And now, for the best part, these are the people in the lab, um, all of whom are students, uh, and, the, and the kind of work they've done. This fellow here, Yer, um, uh, Yaron Carmi, is a postdoc uh, who showed up one day from Israel, first Israeli postdoc I'd ever had, um, and we had these long discussions about what are, what are some of the most important questions facing immunologists, and ultimately came up with this idea, and he pursued it rigorously, but not by himself. He's now returned to Israel, um, fi having finished his training. But he worked closely with this kid with the big smile, Matt Spitzer, Ian Lindy, uh, these two guys. Um, who else was involved in this? I know Nate was helpful. <laughs> and uh, well, anyway, it was a team effort. And then Mike Alonso here, who's standing in the back of the room, um, is actually our senior supervisor in the lab. He finished his postdoctoral fellowship some time ago, but he's providing parental guidance to the other people in the lab. So despite the fact that I don't think Mike is even 30. Are you 30 yet? You're just 30. Um, but I, I guess I want to emphasize to you that we have a very young group. If Mike's the oldest guy in the lab, well, no, I'm the oldest guy, but I, <laughs> by several generations, um, but, uh, but I, don't, I don't get near these things. They're, I'd be dangerous in the lab. But anyway, uh, so these, these kids are anywhere from 20 uh, to 30 years old. Amazing. And, um, and, the, and the amazing work they do. Unfortunately, they, they come, they finish their training, and they leave, which is very challenging for me personally. But notice also that they're standing here right next to the blood center sign. Um, so it reminds me to point out uh, to you that uh, that the blood center was originally created to support uh, not only the production of the best possible blood products and services and the best possible blood testing, but also to support the uh, research in, and teaching in immunohematology and transfusion medicine. And I'm delighted that even though we are now owned by the hospital, um, that we're continuing to be able to work so closely together and, and uh, and being able to continue with making what I think are going to be meaningful discoveries that will help patients going forward. So with that, I think I'll stop and, um, and welcome questions. <laughs> OK, so we will have Q&A until 8.30. And please uh, use the mic and hold it about three inches from your I, mouth. I would just so like to add, before we get started, while I've spent the time talking about our discoveries, I think it's worth pointing out that, uh, let's say, t up to 10 years ago, or even five, I think the idea that patients with cancer would be getting immunotherapy as a standard part of their treatment was, was not even a likelihood. Today, I would say that the likelihood that a patient with cancer is going to be treated with immunotherapy, probably in the next 10 years, this will become the main treatment for cancer. You can imagine that. This is the main treatment. It is, it is replacing, although it hasn't done it yet completely, but it is largely replacing conventional chemotherapy. So this is a revolution that's taking place. I'd like to be able to say it's already here and now and we can do this, and, but we're in the middle of it. Um, and several of these treatments have now been approved. I, I mentioned the checkpoint antibodies. I mentioned the CAR T cells. They're not yet approved. But what's happening today is a complete revolution. And, and the largest pharmaceutical companies like Merck and Genentech Roche and Pfizer and Amgen, they are completely shifting their businesses in order to 
um, <clears throat> aggressively pursue the development and commercialization of immunotherapies. So it's a big deal. And, um, and I can tell you that my course, which used to be a very small course, and we'd have 10 or 12 people in the course, now uh, this year when we gave it, we didn't have enough room in the room to, uh, to uh, allow everybody who wanted to take it to take it, because it's now an established pretty much fact that immunotherapy is now an critically important part of, of uh, cancer treatment, and it's going to become even more so. Uh, Dr. Engelman, is there a transition organism between the mouse and humans that can provide uh, so something closer to our own immune system as a test? Well, that's a, actually a loaded question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, just today we were dealing with the animal police, right? <laughs> so. Uh, the advantage of, of using mice is, um, first of all, they're very small. So they don't require nearly as much in the way of substances to impact your immune system. But mice are remarkably similar in their immune systems as, as humans, believe it or not. They're not genetically identical, obviously. But their immune systems and those of rabbits and monkeys and, um, and other you know, mammalians are extremely similar to one another. The immune systems developed for a purpose and if you don't have one, you don't do very well, whether you're a mouse or a rabbit or a human. So in fact, the systems are almost identical, almost identical. The other advantage of working with, <clears throat> with, with strains of mice is that um, we can genetically manipulate those, those mice. In fact, we have access, to commercial access, to mice that are missing um, any particular gene you want to study. Uh, we, don't, we can't do these crazy things in human beings. And, um, although you're right, uh, you could argue that chimpanzees are, you know, genetically much more similar to humans. We can't do these experiments in chimps. They're protected species. Uh, so the studies we do in mice are extremely carefully done. Uh, we, ha we can control those experiments. We can control the genetic backgrounds. So there are huge advantages and also cost. So it's very, it's very difficult to imagine not starting out with experimental mice. And then once one establishes a principle, you can then try to validate that in human beings. Does the FDA have a fast track capability for uh, cancer patients that are yes. looking <laughs> like they're not going to survive, that this could start being applied to? Or does it require yeah. a large ramp up time? Yeah before yep. you can do this. So you're raising a very important philosophical issue, which uh, is incredibly important and very difficult to discuss in 30-second sound bites. But, and that is, well, why can't something that looks promising be made available to a sick patient, a patient who's dying? Um, the FDA uh, goes back and forth on this. Um, it's a political organization. When a drug is developed and approved by the agency, and then it gets out, and it turns out it has unanticipated toxicity, who gets into trouble? The FDA does. The FDA's mission is to assure the safety, mainly the safety, of new drugs, um, and also the, whether it works or not. Um, there have been two instances in the last 15 years or so where uh, two very widely used drugs were approved by the agency, one for pain and one for uh, type 2 diabetes. And um, in both cases, extensive clinical trials were done. The drugs were approved. They got out. And it turned out they had unanticipated side effects. The drugs were taken off the market. There were congressional hearings, huge amount of um, embarrassment. The agency was accused of being too close to industry, which is, from my perspective, the opposite <laughs> seems to be the case. But, um, but nonetheless, the pendulum swings back and forth. There are mechanisms in place to enable promising new drugs for life-threatening diseases, particularly relatively rare diseases, but also cancers, to move through the clinic much faster than drugs for non-immediately life-threatening diseases. And all of that is good. So I think the agency tries its best to do it. But even under the best of intentions, it's, it always takes years. So even the checkpoint antibodies, which had the backing of these enormous pharmaceutical companies, and they were able to do large trials very quickly, still took several years before they were approved for um, actual human use. So it's still a challenge. I wish it weren't. Uh, quick follow-up. Uh, 
in countries such as Israel, India, China, uh, is this technology likely to take off faster? Another great question. Um, for the most part, the uh, regulatory bodies in other countries have followed the United States in, in modeling their approval process after the US. I, I want to point out, and I, being the devil's advocate here, is that if we didn't have this regulatory, ob hopefully objective analytical approach to looking and seeing whether drugs are effective or not, then there'd be all kinds of stuff and there would, there would be used that undoubtedly wouldn't work. So uh, one of the strengths of the American system is the, is the need for objective, unequivocal proof that something works. And the only way to demonstrate that something works is to actually do a clinical trial. Uh, so it's a, it's a sort of a double-edged sword. Um, I personally wouldn't want to see something we discover widely used until I know it's safe and effective. But that said, there should be other mechanisms in place that can accelerate that. And there are, but they're, they're still limited. It still takes years. Yes, it's here. Yes, sir. Um, what you described required a change in the, in the paradigm with regard to the immune response. And is there any chance that what you've learned could be applied to, to um, organ transplant so that instead of using immunosuppressive drugs, the understanding that underlies all of this would allow you to do an organ transplant and not have to use immunosuppressive drugs? Great question. <clears throat> in fact, um, I collaborate with uh, other uh, faculty at Stanford in an effort to do just that. Uh, and um, uh, and it's, uh, it looks very promising. Now, I have to say that I should say in, uh, in uh, full disclosure, <clears throat> the, uh, my faculty colleagues and I were scientific founders of a company, a biotech company out of Stanford that is designed to do exactly what you've said. And in fact, there are about 40 patients at Stanford uh, have been treated with an approach designed to avoid the use of immunosuppressive drugs. And there are about uh, 40 patients who have received kidney transplants at Stanford have actually I think about 30 of them are on no drugs at this point. So there is a way to do this. Uh, it's, it takes years to develop these things, and, um, but it looks like it, it's very promising. Uh, it's obviously the flip side of what we're trying to do for, for cancer. Uh, two questions about the ALOG C plus DC stimulation with checkpoint blockade. Uh, first is, have you published the results uh, where we could read it? And second, when you listed types of cancers, you tested it in mice, you did not have prostate cancer on the list. Is prostate cancer something that would work? It should work, it? we just didn't test it. Okay. <clears throat> um, the paper, the definitive paper describing this work was published in, the, in an April, May issue of Nature. Um, and we can make that paper available, but it's very dense reading, I warn you, um, even that's for, pardon me? The yes, that's the Carmi paper. Um, there are two other papers that were published subsequent that we wrote by the, in, at invitation that are much simpler. Uh, they're called commentaries, they're only a couple of pages long, that basically explain the highlights of what was published in the Nature paper. And uh, if you let us know, we can make those, two, they, those available to you as well. And they're very easy reading, I think. Um, and, they, and they basically explain what we, what we showed in that Nature paper. Um, so yes, the work is published. Okay, thank you. Yes, oops. I don't control it. <laughs> uh, first, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment if there have been studies uh, to show if using the body's immune system in this manner uh, might trigger autoimmune disorder, things such as vasculitis, for example. Well, by definition, um, that can happen. That's why we have autoimmune disorders, is because the body's immune system sometimes makes mistakes and uh, lashes out where it shouldn't. Um, most of the time, we believe that's, um, 
that happens when the immune system thinks something bad is there and keeps attacking and it, and it, it mistakes normal tissues for something that shouldn't be there. And we have to use the kind of drugs we've talked about to try to slow that process down. Um, the amazing thing is that most people don't develop life-threatening autoimmune disease despite having these uh, very complicated uh, immunological weapons uh, at, at hand. I'm questioning since uh, we, we really don't understand oh, yeah, the I would agree with autoimmune you. mechanism in the first place. Oh, you're absolutely right. I, I mean, uh, we're just now beginning to crack the proverbial code on how to turn the immune system against cancer. It's, um, we still don't understand the pathogenetic basis of most autoimmune diseases. We don't know why they start, um, and the treatments for them are generally nonspecific. They're getting better for some of those diseases, but no, I agree with you. There's, uh, there's lots of opportunity to make things better still. I, I was commenting earlier about the cost of some of these treatments, and I know I have a, a, a strong position um, but it's a real problem. I mentioned the, the, the Dendrion vaccine at $100,000. Right now, one of the most exciting areas of investigation is genetically, modif genetically modified white blood cells, or CAR-Ts. And, and some of the results that have been obtained with CAR-Ts are incredibly dramatic in certain forms of leukemia and certain forms of lymphoma. Um, and the question is, and that has led to the creation of, uh, of, of widely uh, famous biotech companies like Juno and Kite and others. And, and the question that I ask, and I ask this throughout our, our tumor immunology course is, well, it takes them three weeks to make, these, to make these cells from a given patient. And yeah, you can cure those diseases, um, but it's going to cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this. So at what point do we say those, those treatments should be approved and made available and paid for? Uh, and, and say, well, no, 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 let's, let's not do that. Let's figure out a way to do it without manipulating the cell. It's a big, big problem. And what I guess I'm trying to say is that the science is getting better, and we're getting to develop more effective therapies, but the cost of those therapies is something that we're going to have to deal with sooner or later. I got the impression that some form of immunotherapy is accepted. And, and I was wondering whether that's widely used and whether there are specific hospitals where it's practice or is that restricted? Or, and and yeah. what is the outlook for? Sure. So um, <clears throat> today, as I mentioned, most of the large pharmaceutical companies have, I shouldn't say most, um, there are <clears throat> two types of checkpoint antibodies that are now FDA approved and available for the treatment of certain cancers. They're, they're, they are at least partially effective for malignant melanoma, um, kidney cancer, some forms of lung cancer, and some forms of bladder cancer. Uh, they have not been shown to be effective for most other tumors. Are the treatments then considered immunotherapy? Yes. And that defines them. And then a person can inquire at a hospital whether they provide that, and if so, what form? Yeah, so I, I call immunotherapy any therapy that's designed to either, if you go back to the first slide, <clears throat> I don't know if I can do that. Oh, here we go. Um, passive or active. These are all immunotherapies. In the case of the passives, we're providing the, immune, we're providing the immune molecules or the immune cells to the patient. In the case of the active immunotherapy, we're providing things to activate the immune system. These are all immune therapies. Monoclonal antibodies for the treatment of cancer have been available for at least 15 years. I, I mentioned that they're generally well tolerated, but they're, they're not generally curing any patients. Um, and they're available for the treatment of breast, certain forms of breast cancer, certain forms of lung cancer, um, certain forms of lymphoma, and so forth. Uh, these are widely available, absolutely. Uh, these are FDA approved and commercially available. These are not yet approved. These are experimental. Um, very powerful, very expensive to make. Uh, over here, we, the only uh, active immunotherapy, um, well, the first one it was the, uh, with the prostate cancer vaccine that we discovered and subsequently developed at Dendrion. And then more recently, checkpoint antibodies have now been approved by the FDA, two of them, two different varieties. And I mentioned that the tumors that they can be, they're used for. And 
sometimes they're dramatically effective. I think the most dramatic um, uh, impact of the checkpoint antibodies is in melanoma, which is a type of skin cancer that often develops as a result of too much sun exposure. And uh, many times when the tumors are caught early, they can be removed surgically. You just cut them out and everything's fine. But if they then become, if they spread and metastasize, they're deadly. And up until a few years ago, we had no effective treatment for uh, malignant melanoma once it spread. And that's one of the tumors that's becoming more and more common. Uh, but now we, have, um, now we have checkpoint antibodies. And many patients with metastatic melanoma can live for years um, when they get these checkpoint antibodies. I can't say that it's 100%, but it's, it's, it's somewhere, you know, it's close to half. It's really amazing. So there have been these amazing advances from immunotherapy. Dr. Ree? Yes. Um, the Veterans Administration is struggling to deal with the Vietnam era veterans that were exposed to Agent Orange who magically are coming up with cancer from something that was perfectly harmless. Uh, would it be possible to work with the VA to accelerate the process of clinical trials with this cohort? Well, um, you're raising something that I would call political, not just medical, but political. And the VA system has its own system. It has its own funding system, um, its own medical system. I mean, it's really, I can tell you, and my colleagues in my research lab can tell you how hard it is to get financial support for this kind of research. Believe it or not, the amount of money that the, <clears throat> the NIH, which is the main government source of uh, research uh, support for biomedical research has been flat to down for the last seven or eight years. Um, and there's no appetite to see it increase. The VA system has its own uh, medical research, clinical trials support system. And uh, I, I probably shouldn't touch that. But I would say that um, you know, activism is, is, is one way to try to procure dollars for that kind of research. Um, I read a case report of, uh, regarding glioblastoma where, um, I think it was in Southern California, where they took glioblastoma tissue from 10 or 20 or 30 patients and they ground it up and then injected it, I think sub-Q, into a patient who was very end-stage glioblastoma, failed all of the therapies. And he had a, at least at autopsy, he died of something else, I believe, and they found no viable tumor. Uh, no viable glioblastoma. Was this, is this sort of a, s a similar mechanism? It's immunotherapy. Um, <clears throat> but there, but it was a, did it have its biological effect through the same mechanism that you're referring to here? I would, I would speculate that the answer would be yes. One of the most famous approaches to glioblastoma, which is another terrible type of tumor in the brain, uh, was described in the 60 Minutes. I don't know how many of you saw, watch 60 Minutes, but about a year ago, uh, 60 Minutes, devoted its entire one-hour show, as I recall, to uh, research being undertaken at Duke University with polio virus. And it was a form of polio virus that was being injected into the tumor to induce an immune response to the polio virus and ultimately to the tumor. And uh, I haven't seen this work published, which is one of the reasons why I was so surprised to see this session on 60 Minutes. But Nonetheless, it looked like a pretty dramatic and interesting approach. It's, a, it's another immunotherapeutic approach. So yes, what you described sounded like an attempt at immunotherapy. But I haven't seen anything reproducible to make, that, to make me think that's a, a viable approach going forward. But the, the use of viruses to do this is, a, is an alternative. I should have probably included it on my list. Um, so the question was, what are the next steps for our work? The next step, obviously, would be to try to be able to bring this work into clinical trials. And, um, and, the, and, 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 and Mike and others in the lab are, and I are working on this. Uh, <clears throat> how do we do it? I think inevitably it's going to be very difficult to do it at Stanford because it's too costly. It's not going to cost us a billion dollars, but it's going to cost us many millions. So I think the only viable way to do this would be through a biotech company. So my guess is that's what we're going to be doing. Um, at least my hope is that's what we're going to be doing. The, uh, uh, and, and 
maybe we'll get into clinical trials as early as next year, next couple of years, uh, but it's not going to happen in the next month or two. It's pretty complicated. I keep thinking that the Stanford BioX program might, if they could step in, uh, really help in automating some of this extensive process to help cut the cost down. I keep thinking in terms of what has happened with the Human Genome Project and how that's gone from billions to, to a thousand. Yeah, you're right. So as much as I express concern over the cost of goods or the cost of manufacturing, particularly the cell-based and genetic therapies where you combine genetic engineering and you genetically alter the cells so that they become attack cells. I, I mean, right now it's costing, I can't imagine how much it would cost on a per patient basis. I'm guessing $100,000 to $200,000 at least. So your question is, well, isn't it possible that human ingenuity can greatly improve this process and make it far less expensive? And the answer is yes, of course. The question is, how low can it go? Can it get to the point where an individualized cell therapy is really is cost effective? Um, and it's a great discussion point. And I would say, yeah, eventually it might happen. I know in the course that I'm teaching, um, I, I, we spent a whole session on, on the CAR T cells and the pluses and minuses of CAR T. These are the genetically engineered T cells that I, I mentioned to you that look very promising for certain forms of leukemia. Not so solid tumors yet, but leukemias look pretty good. And I was, you know, criticizing the cost and so forth. And one of the great costs is having to take the cells out from each patient and manipulate them and so forth. And then uh, in between the week that I, we had that session and the following week, which was yesterday, on Wednesday, an announcement was made that a biotech company had come up with a way of creating uh, off-the-shelf, off-the-shelf CAR T cells because they didn't have to come from the patient. And they had done genetic manipulation of the cells to make them tolerable to the patient. And they treated one patient, N of one. Um, it was a one-year-old baby uh, with a, acute leukemia, and they cured that patient's leukemia. And that announcement was all over the news, and the stock of that company went way up, and the stock of the other companies went way down. Um, and uh, I know I have to mention this because all of these, most of this work is being done by uh, for-profit biotech companies, so at least that's their goal. Is it going to work, an off-the-shelf universal cell CAR T? Maybe. We had that discussion in the classroom on Wednesday, and um, we're going to know in another couple of years. I would say it's a really interesting idea. Um, stay tuned. But yes, I, I generally believe in the ability of, of, uh, of my colleagues in science to solve these problems. I just don't know how long it's going to take. And I still think the best approach is to be able to be able just to inject something and find the right cells and tell them what to do and everything works from there. That would be the ideal. As you were um, instrumental in kind of helping the FDA regulate this treatment, um, do you think that there's a possibility that you may be able to um, negotiate some kind of a backdoor then for people if they sign a, a disclaimer uh, that they can get a treatment? No. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, no. <laughs> I, I, lots of things, I, you know, there, it, somebody mentioned earlier the possibility of doing drug development in other countries where the path may be faster. Um, it's possible, but as I said, most of the, most of the developed world is now following uh, the, the U.S. model in terms of balancing, um, you know, the need for new treatments with the need to be cautious. So no, I don't think there's a shortcut. At least I haven't figured it out. I have a question about funding, just for our information. We, it seems like we uh, have frequent solicitations to give donations to fund cancer research. And I just wonder, um, does any of that money flow to the kind of work that you do? Uh, and as an alternative to that, are we going to have to rely on venture capital funding in, for profit-making companies in order to get this developed? Yeah, you almost answered your own questions. Um, you know, the <clears throat> this gets again into a very dicey subject, which is how much regulation is appropriate, um, and why do we have so much? So, for ex in general, if you want to develop a drug for a non-immediately life-threatening condition, it costs a huge amount of money. 
you want to develop a drug for obesity or even diabetes, it can cost a billion dollars. Or for Alzheimer's disease, it's a billion dollars. You can't get around it. You have to do so much safety testing and so much long-term efficacy testing, it's extraordinarily expensive. That makes it very difficult for you know, academics to do anything in those fields. We can make the discoveries, to be sure. But trying to get the development process through, it's very difficult to imagine that being done with smaller amounts of money. Um, for very rare diseases, or you know, uh, there are exceptions made. Uh, the FDA still has to regulate it, and it's somewhat less costly, uh, but it still requires quite a bit of money. I, it would be very, very unusual to see a development process take place in a nonprofit um, because of the amount of money and expertise that would be required. I think what we're really good at here is the discovery. Um, and trying to take it from discovery here, I scratch my head. I say, what is the, what is the best? We, we talk about this almost every day. How can we move this faster? Um, we have to make some scientific and technical choices. We have to think about you know, what's the most likely combination of our molecules that's going to work. Um, and then inevitably say, oh my god, it's going to cost us $10 million just to get this through the first clinical trial. How do we do that? So I think it's pretty tough. There are, however, um, as many of you know, there are some wonderful foundations as well as the NIH that support initial studies, um, uh, you know, both the discovery effort and some early trials, depending on the cost of goods. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but I would say that in the end, it's pretty tough to do it without investment and companies. Well, OK, we're just about at 8.30. I, I, unless anybody else has a burning question, I guess I'll stop. Oh, OK, one more. I was wondering whether you felt that the work you're doing here could eventually be applicable to a cure for the common cold. Oh. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say whether you thought the work was really worth it. <laughs> Um, I get up every day and I'm really excited about what I do. Uh, and I, there's nothing more exciting than coming to work here and working with these really bright students. I mean, it's a real privilege. Common cold is not one of the things we're currently working on, although they bother me when I get them um, <laughs> terribly, uh, or the flu, which can be dangerous. So um, <clears throat> I, I do believe in the future of, of science. I do believe that. <clears throat> that science can solve almost any disease. I, I think that within 20 or 30 years, it would not surprise me if cancer was largely controlled, just the same way hepatitis C is and HIV is controlled. I mean, I was there when HIV was discovered, and everybody who was infected with it died. I was there when we talked about hepatitis C as a virus that was widely around. And we said, oh, we're never going to have a treatment for hepatitis C. Today, it's cured. It's cured. If you have hepatitis C infection, chances are about 99% that if you take certain medicines for a few months, you will be cured. Um, now, there's controversy about what the drug company is charging for that treatment. Um, but I would say that's pretty amazing. And uh, so I am really optimistic. I wish that I could live another 100 years. Then we could, you know, then we won't be dying of cancer. We'll be probably dying of other things, but not cancer. So um, no, I'm, I, th I think that even the common cold can, can be conquered. I, I think there's more emphasis right now on, on lethal diseases, as I guess I think it's appropriate. But uh, I'm, I'm really optimistic. I've never been more optimistic, even about the common cold. OK, right. Well, thanks. thank you all for coming. And thank you, Dr. Engelman. <laughs>